great to see you here at Central Community today. I'm obviously in Tijuana, as you can see behind me. We've been working hard all day here at Saturday evening at Siempre para los Niños. We started our work early this morning with breakfast together after getting in Friday night, and we've been building all day. Come and see what we've been doing. We actually have three buildings that are going on today. We started the big blue building you'll see as we enter. That's where we'll close up with the message today. This is Lighthouse to the left at Siempre Carlos Nino. It started out with just tons of lumber today, and it's come into a building. We started with nothing more than a pad. The blue building down here, this is the workroom. This will be a room where We'll have young men and young women who don't have jobs but need training and they'll be able to come here and they'll train to be tradesmen, they'll train to be, train to be mechanics, they'll train with people who are journeymen who will be able to work with them and do that. So I can show you inside the building. We've had Miguel working with us all day long. One of the houses you'll see is Miguel's. Miguel's our caretaker here at Siempre. Say hi, Miguel. <laughs> and, and Miguel is excited because he's got a house. Miguel, has it been feeling good today? One of the cool parts of the story today is that it was all the kids from Siempre who were working with Miguel. And so the house that was built was built by the orphans of Siempre para los Niños, which is pretty outstanding. This is the house, and this is a, not a house, but the workshop. And this is all going out just today, astonishingly enough. The guys who were up here on the roof, Levi and Owen and Moises, they wanted to go all day. Mark Berg's been in charge of it. This is a double garage door that will be in here. They'll be able to bring cars in. They're setting up a pulley over here to be able to pull engines, engines to be able to train. They'll have body work so they can train them in body work. And then they'll also have a wood shop as well so they'll be able to train them in wood shop. So the people who might otherwise, you know, run to the United States to get a job. Instead, would be able to be trained right here in Tijuana, would be able to have a job here in Tijuana, be part of the community, of their own community. Um, so then when we come down here, let me show you Miguel's house because it's really cool what's going on. This property, if you look at it, you can see chickens fighting each other and you see cats running around on it. If you look back, you get a scope of just how big this property is. We, in the space looking back towards this blue building, we still have enough open land to build a building the size of the sanctuary that we're sitting in this morning. So it's really an exceptional piece of property. And then down here at the bottom, this little yellow house here, this is a pad for bathroom, an exterior bathroom that's going to be going in tomorrow. The little, little yellow house is going to be Miguel's house. And this was built by the children of Cedar Carlos Nino today. Miguel and Chan. And they work hard. And I should say the teenagers. Most of the teenagers, but a lot of younger kids as well. They painted, they worked. Tomorrow we'll drywall, we'll finish off the roof. This is the front room. There's a kitchen over here. Up above there's a loft, so when the roof goes in, that'll be a loft. There's two bedrooms, one bedroom over here, bedroom here. This will be the washroom. There will be an upright washer and dryer over here. There will be vanity over here, then a bathtub and a shower right here. Miguel's worked with us for 12 years now, and without Miguel's help in getting this property, it wouldn't have been possible. And he's been our caretaker for approximately five years here at Siempre Para Los Niños, so we're excited to be able to have build a caretaker's house, and Miguel will be the first occupant of that residence. I wanted to talk with you this morning about building a future. Because really when you look at all of this, it's about building a future. Because the garden was planted by Miguel years ago, but it's been tended dutifully on a daily basis right through the junk that was covering all of this. And when the junk went away, there was a beautiful garden. And so that's what we're wanting to do, is kind of take some of the junk out of the lives of children that have been abandoned, take some of the junk out of lives of people who are living in poverty, and be able to allow them to nurture as the sun reaches them, the sun of God, Christ Jesus, and he touches them, and he begins just to draw them up so that they have a future, that they have a hope. Last week I talked about from Jeremiah 29, 11, you know, for I know the plans that I have for you. They're plans not for disaster, but they're plans for good, plans for a future, and plans for a hope. And so this is part two that I want to talk about this morning on the same exact topic except from Jeremiah 29, 12, and 13. So let's come on up to 
the main house up here at Life House. And it's a play on words. We're using, obviously, the term lighthouse as a beacon. And because this is the way people are living right here. These are the neighbors for Siempre Parlos Ninos, people who are you know, living with dirt floors and outhouses. And it wasn't that very long ago that right here on this property, it was the same way. This little building here has been Miguel's bathroom for the last 12 years. And so now he's going to have much nicer. Some of these cars are part of the cool cars that have been left here on the property. Miguel was a mechanic, so this Jeep is one of the things. The kids are going to be involved in restoration processes on them, and then they'll become the property of Siempre Carlos Niños, and the children will drive them. The music you hear in the background is from across the street. It's they get going on the whole thing, and so we'll just have to contend with that as we go through the message. So I hope you enjoy the kind of the background vibe of Tijuana as we do all of this. Entering in here, we enter into Lifehouse at Siempre, and Lifehouse is just exactly what we want it to be. It's going to be a large room where there will be able to be gatherings of children, for children who aren't able to make it into school, children who need a place to go when their parents are away at work, children who are able to be found, and even more than that, it's a transition. On a regular basis here at Siempre, we have families that want to abandon their children. But they're not, able, they're not in a spot really where they have to abandon their children. They're poor, they're people who want better for their children. What we want to do is give them better while they're with their family. We believe that a child is always best with their family, even if they're living in poverty. And so our goal is to try to give them that opportunity. So here in Lifehouse, we have this great room here. And the whole building's about 1,700 square feet. And we've got a smaller room over here for training and coming straight up into the sun as we look at this. And what I wanted to talk about, and you may have your card with you there today. And if you have your card, go ahead and pull it out because we still want to fill in the blanks in your life. And the card for today, text at the top of it, it has a great picture of Tom Wood building down here at CMP from a couple years ago. And it says, in those days when you pray, I will listen. If you look for me in earnest, you will find me. When you seek me, I will be found by you. And I believe that. I believe that that's part of what we're doing here. One of the things that's happened at Siempre is people, when we build a building, they always say the same thing. Oh, it's just like that movie, Field of Dreams. When you, if you build it, they will come. And I always kind of laugh about it. But really, in a way, it's true. Because it's not like everything's finished when we build a building. I mean, this is just the beginning. It's a seed into a community that begins to invite people in to know that God has a hope, God has a heart, God has a solution for the problems that they're facing today. And so out of the five ways it says to build a future that rocks the world, first one is to talk to God and to let our hopes and our dreams out. It says, when you pray. And when we pray, I think we're often confused about how we should pray in life. I mean, we want to pray for our families, we want to pray for our needs, we want to pray for our finances. And one of the things we need to pray about when we talk to God is to make sure that we're letting our hopes and dreams out. And what are you hoping for today? Do you hope for a better world? Do you dream about a life where there can be peace, where there can be people who are living in community? If you're dreaming and hoping about these things, talk to God about it. Let your hopes and dreams out and find out what your part in His plan is. Everyone that was here today worked incredibly hard to somehow let this dream and this hope come into being. And it's been an incredible gift to watch these people go through this hard, hard work. And as they've worked hard at doing this, it's been a gift to watch them each one say, thank you for letting me be here. We had a friend driving or fly in from Minnesota and wanted to stop by to say, I want to be here all day Sunday so that I can work on the project. And they'll be here with his family tomorrow. We had friends flying from Washington over here today. Worked hard all day long. They'll be working tomorrow. Spent a lot of money to be here. Friends, Chad, in fact, who grew up at Central Community and filming this right now on my phone, came in with his friends from their church in Arizona and said, you know, we want to be a part of this. It's a place where we can talk to God and share our hopes and dreams because we believe there's a better way to share in the community that God wants. Second way to build a future that rocks the world is to stay silent. Now at some point, we have to stay silent and just wait for the miracle of waiting on God. Because when we join into that miracle of waiting on God, it says this, it says, I will listen. And for us, imagine for a second that the God of all creation is listening. 
Now for him to listen, think about how many things he has to stay silent to. How many things he puts aside. And yet for you and me, we don't take just those few minutes to stay silent before God and say, God, I want to rest my heart. I want to rest my spirit before you. And just like here, the sun's going behind clouds and it's just at sunset. It's almost as if there's a silence that moves. And for us, there's a time when there's that sunset in our lives and when we need to say, okay, today, God, there's a time that I'm feeling challenged. I'm going to stay silent before you and I want to listen to whatever it is that you have for me. I love the quote that's on the bottom of your card by Sarah Young. It says, worry is an act of rebellion. It is doubting God's promises to care for you. How many of us think about worry as an act of rebellion? I mean, that instead of saying, you know, worry about nothing but pray about everything. And then if you're not praying about everything, if you're not listening to God, that you're rebelling against him. And for us to say, you know, if we listen, if we pray that God will listen to us, that begins to take it into a whole new dimension. On the back of your card, then, the third way to build a future that rocks the world is to break away from the crowd and to search for him. Just to break away completely, it says, if you look for me in earnest, if you look for me in earnest, are you diligently looking for God in your life today? I mean, is it something this morning, excuse me, that's right, this morning, it's tonight where I'm at. Um, but when we begin to diligently look for God and we make our lives about the pursuit of God, not that we're perfect and not that we're accomplishing everything, but in everything we're diligently pursuing what God wants for our lives. In everything we're saying, God, I want to somehow find what it is that you want for me. And I want to pursue that. The quote from G.B. Foster says, Jesus blew everything apart. And when I saw where the pieces landed, I knew I was free. You know, that's what it feels like when we come down here on these weekends at Memorial Day weekend. For those of you who've never been, and for those of you who remember it, you walk in and it looks like someone blew everything apart. There's lumber, there's drywall, everything just looks crazy. And there's a few pieces of concrete. But then by the end of the day, you look around and you start to catch the vision for God that he blew everything apart. But then here it is coming back together. It's easy for us to get into the wrong crowd and to get caught up with the status quo. And at some point we have to break away from that crowd. At some point we have to continue on and believe that we can do it at each one of the houses. It's always fun. Or each one of the buildings we're building. It's fun to watch the people compete. And you can see each one of the team leaders, each one of the buildings. We got more done today than we've ever done on a first day. But a lot of it had to do with people wanting to break away and, you know, we can do it. We can do this for God. And for us to break away and say, you know, we can do this. We don't have to give up. We don't have to quit. It's a big change for us in our lives. Then the fourth way to build a future that rocks the world is to hold on to his promise and join the adventure. You know, maybe you're in a spot in your life where you don't want to rock the world. Maybe you think, well, you know. What I want for my life is just to make sure to catch my television shows. What I want for my life is to make sure that my American Idol wins. Mine didn't. Jessica Sanchez lost. I can't believe that stupid Philip Phillips one. But maybe you're at a spot in your life where that's just the status quo and that's cool with you. But maybe you really would like to hold on to his promise and join the adventure. When we started building here over 12 years ago, we never imagined everything that's here today. But what we did was we began. We said, we just want to get involved in your adventure, God. And if you're opening doors, we want to walk through those doors. And what we've done is just each day tried to walk through and walk through those doors, hoping that God would continue to deliver, and he's delivered beyond anything that we could ever understand or imagine. Not that there haven't been the challenges. There have been heartbreaking challenges. And not that it hasn't been overwhelming financially. Sometimes it's been so overwhelming financially. And not that it hasn't been exhausting. It's been exhausting. And adventures are overwhelming. Adventures are exhausting. And some people say you don't even begin to the adventure until everything goes wrong. And that's really where a lot of life's adventures just get started for us. And if everything's at a spot in your life right now, and it feels like your whole world has been rocked. Maybe it's time to think, you know what, I'd like to rock the world for God and I'd like to build a new future. And when we do that, we hold on. He says, you will find me when you seek me. 
I'm a child of the 60s. Growing up in the 60s, people said the same thing on a regular basis. A man who is in search of God has already found him. And it was kind of a cool quote. And I liked it, and people had t-shirts that said it on, but really, they didn't understand that they were true. It says, you will find me when you seek me. There aren't any other gods to find. You start seeking for God, you're going to find him. There's only one. You can find a whole lot of wrong directions, you can find a whole lot of mistakes, but you start looking diligently for God. You will find him. A friend of mine who's in 12-step groups recently came to me, and he wanted to know, what about the 12 steps, Pastor Eric? Do you really think that there's something good in it? Do you think that maybe I, it draws me away from God? And I taught him something that my brother taught me when he was first finding his sobriety. He said, if you work the 12 steps, they always lead to the foot of the cross. And I believe that. I believe for each one of us that holds on to his promise. There's a big, long quote on your card right there, but it's a great quote. It says, if you check out the life of Jesus, you will discover what made him perfect. He did not attain a state of perfection by carrying around in his pocket a list of rules and regulations or by seeking to conform to the cultural mores of his time. He was perfect because he never made a move without his father. He never made a move without his father. Rock the world, live like Jesus, and start just moving where God moves you. And it will change everything in your life. And finally, the fifth way to build a future that rocks the world is to understand that we can be home again. See, home again is waiting in every open door in our lives. It says, I will be found by you. Jesus, when he was right on the edge of his death, he said, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. But trust God, trust me. I'm going home. He didn't say, I'm going to heaven. He, didn't say, he said, I'm going home to my father's house. And if I go there, I'll come back for you so that you can be with me because I'm preparing a place for you there, home. For you and me to be home again. Have you felt disenfranchised in your life? Have you felt like you're in a spot where you just need to be home again? He says, I will be found by you. See, home again is waiting for you and me. And when we get to that spot where we feel like I'm lonely, I don't know which way to go, I don't know if there is a future for me, we can understand that, well, actually, there's home again for each one of us. In the church I grew up in, the preacher used to close the sermon real often with a little song. It went like this, it said, Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home. And then it got to the real tearjerker part. It said this, softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, poor sinner. I thought, the finger's pointing right at me. I always felt like, come home. You know, I know what it's like to live in a cave on an island off the coast of Turkey. I know what it's like to spend nights underneath an avocado tree on an off-ramp in San Jose. I know what it's like to travel for months with just a backpack on my back and to be so far from home. But the wonderful part...